So today is the first of a two-part lecture on joins. So today we're going to focus on uh, parallel hash joins uh, to get started because these are the most common ones. And then on uh, Monday next week, we'll do sort merge joins, uh, which is another class of join algorithms. So for today's class, we'll start off with the background of, of joins. Um, again, everyone should, have, should know what a join is and, and roughly what we're trying to do here. Uh, but then we'll go into more detail how to do a parallel hash join. And then the two major design decisions we're going to have in our join algorithm is the hash function and the uh, hashing scheme. So we'll talk about how to handle this, and then we'll uh, finish off with an evaluation. Okay? Okay. All right. So when you took the introduction database class, we taught you joins, but we don't we didn't tell you anything about how you're actually going to really execute it, right? We didn't talk about threads. We didn't talk about uh, uh, you know how do you actually build the hash table, how you should build it. I mean, and ha how you actually do build you know what hash function you're going to use. Um, but now in a modern system, since we're going to have a bunch of cores, we need to be able to do our join in parallel because this is going to end up being the most expensive operation that you can do in your database system. I know the paper that you guys read says otherwise, but we'll look at two sets of numbers. Um, so we're going to use all these extra threads we have to be able to process our join in parallel and then speed up our, our speed up the operation. So the two main approaches in any major OLAP system that you can compute a join in in parallel uh, is either the hash join or the sort merge join algorithm. Um, and so again, this lecture will be at the hash join, and then on Monday next week we'll do the sort merge join. So we're not going to discuss nested loop joins at all. In fact, like when we introduce joins in the inter introduction class, we start off with the nested loop join because it's the most easiest one to understand because it's just two for loops uh, iterating over the outer table and the inner table. Um, and I'll, what I'll say is that the one way to sort of think about this is that, well, first of all, nest loop joins are more common in OLTP environments because in these applications for these database systems, you're not actually re joining really large tables with each other, right? So again, think of an OLTP environment, the join would be, you know, for Andy's a customer account, get all his orders, right? And so it's a one record get my, to get my uh, customer account and then a small number of orders uh, that you just join together. And so typically in, in, in an OLTP environment, you would model the database with foreign keys. So in order to enforce the foreign key, you have to build an index uh, so you can check that any time you insert something to the child that the key uh, that's paired up with the parent actually exists, and they use an index for that. So you end up always doing an index nested loop join where you go grab the one key you need from the, the outer table, and then you can join it together with uh, the inner table through the index. And when you sort of think about it at a high level, this is essentially doing the same thing as a a hash, hash join, right? And a hash join, what happens is you assume there's no index, so you build the hash table on the fly on the outer table, and then that way you can then probe into it with the, the, the inner table. In a, in a OLTP environment, you already have the index. It'll be a B plus tree usually, not a hash table. But at the end of the day, this is essentially going to be the, the same thing. So we're not going to talk about nested loop joins other than just think about it at a high level. A, uh, an index and nested loop join is almost the same thing as a hash table, except or hash join, except that you already have the index built. So the the classic debate in in database systems is this uh, back and forth between uh, sort merge join and uh, hash joins. So in the 1970s, with the first database systems. Uh, it was assumed back then that sort merge join was the, was the best way to do a join algorithm. And this is because back then they did not know how, at least as far as I can tell, they didn't know how to do efficient hash joins when the size of, of the tables you wanted to join together and the hash table itself exceeded the amount of memory that was available to, to the system. Whereas in the case of sorting, they knew how to do external merge sort back then. I uh, can do it re reasonably efficient, efficiently. So it was deemed back then that sorting sort merge was the better way to go. Then in the 1980s, we saw the rise of these database machines that we talked about last class, where now inside of this specialized hardware that was designed for the database system, they added a special coprocessor accelerator, if you will, to do hash joins efficiently. So then it came out that the hash joined algorithms were better in the 1980s. 
Then in the 1990s, Gertz Graffy from the volcano fame at Cascades, he has a paper that basically says, well, if you, if you try a bunch of different things and try different different workloads and other, other uh, scenarios, sort merge join ends up being equivalent to uh, hash join. Right? They get roughly the same performance. But then in the 2000s and since then, uh, hashing has dominated. And I think this is partly due to uh, more memory uh, and, and uh, faster processors and more cores. So in this environment now, the hash join, at least from the early 2000s, has been the dominant join algorithm that everyone that we, we, we now acknowledge is the superior one. So hashing was dominant in the, in the 2000s. In the 2010, uh, where we're currently at now, the question is really rather not whether you want to do sort merge join versus hash join, right? Everyone says you, you should always do a hash join. The question is whether you want to do a partition hash join or a non-partition hash join. Uh, and we'll cover what, what those are as we go along. And then for the 2020s, in Donald Trump's second administration, who knows what will happen, right? We might, we might be all dead, right? <laughs> so the, in the last 10 years, though, as, as I said, the history of, uh, of what's the superior join algorithm has gone through a, a bunch of uh, phases. And this, and this has mostly been carried on by uh, different uh, academics publishing papers that say, you know, one, this approach is better than, than another one. And so the first one in this, in this class came out in 2009, um, and this was a joint paper from, from researchers at Oracle and Intel. And this is sort of the, one of the first ones that showed in, in the modern Harvard scenario that the hash join was better than the sort merge join, except that they, they posit that if you had wider SIMD registers, then sort merge will actually be superior. So if you don't know what a, a SIMD register is or what, what, what I mean by wider SIMD registers, we're going to cover that uh, on Monday a little bit and then also on Wednesday next class when we talk about vectorized execution. Um, so back then, I forget how, I, mean, I think they had 128-bit registers, uh, but now we have 512-bit registers to do SIMD in AVX 512. So now we actually have the hardware they, that they talked about in 2009 to make sort merge actually be superior. Um, but so, as far as I know, nobody's actually done that investigation uh, between, between this yet, now that we have the hardware available to us. Um, in 2011, uh, some researchers at Wisconsin came along and they started showing that uh, and me measuring and identifying the different trade-offs for having a partition hash join versus a non-partition hash join. Then the hyper guys came along and sort of threw a bomb in the middle of the room and said, well, no, you guys are all stupid. Sort merge is actually already faster than hash join, even if you don't have the SIMD stuff that the, the Intel guys said you needed up here. Um, so that was in 2012. But then a year later, it said, oh, wait, ignore what we said in the previous year. Uh, you don't want to use sort merge join. You definitely want to use hashing. And we really mean it this time. Um, and then in 2013, again, there was another paper from, uh, it was a paper from the guys at ETH Zurich from the systems group. And they showed that you want to actually use a, a Radix hash join, a Radix partition hash join, which is what uh, these guys were talking about up here. Um, and then now where we're at in the paper you guys read from 2016, uh, the guys at uh, Saarland basically said it's actually way more complicated uh, than just saying one's always better than another. There's a bunch of different scenarios, a bunch of different cases where you know, one, one approach, and when I say approach, I mean partition versus non-partition, where one of those approaches to a hash join might be superior to another one. The other key thing about this paper and why I really like it is that they actually try to build the, you know, they didn't build a full system, but they actually try to make sure that they understand how these joint algorithms would work in the context of a real database system. So one of the big criticisms about, uh, maybe not so much the hyper papers, but a lot of these other papers is that they're not actually doing the full steps you would do to do a join. They're not actually materializing tuples. They're saying they do compute the join, see that there's a match, and then throw away the result. But there's actually a sort of extra copying step you have to do. And then these guys uh, actually try to try to do it. So what are our design goals in, in a parallel join algorithm? So this is true not just for the hash join, but also for the sort merge, sort, sort merge join. Um, right? These look a lot different than what we talked about in a introduction class when we were really focused on disk I.O. Right? We were trying to choose algorithms, choose join, join algorithms based on how much things we're going to have to read and write the disk, given the, the amount, of, amount of, the, of available memory to us. But now in an in in-memory database system, we, again, we assume the input's going to be all in memory, but also we're, we're going to assume that we have enough space to store the hash table, whatever intermediate data structures we have, 
to compute the join, we're going to assume all of that's in memory as well. So what do we actually need to care about? So at a high level, there's two goals that, we, that we, we, want to, we want to have in our join algorithm. So the first is that we want to minimize the amount of synchronization that needs to go on from the different threads uh, that are running to compute our join algorithm. Right? Again, in an introduction class, we just talk about there's these two for loops, or if you're doing an S loop join, and you don't worry about whether other threads are computing uh, the join at the same time as you. But now, since we want to parallelize our work across as many cores as possible, we don't want to have them take latches or block on each other as we go along. We'll have to block on phases of the join, going from one phase to the next, but inside a phase, we don't want to do any synchronization or coordination. And the second goal is that we want to minimize the, uh, the, the CPU cache misses. So this is a little different than the locality stuff that we talked about last class. Now we want to make sure that uh, any time uh, a thread tries to read something uh, from memory in order to do some computation on it, we want to make sure that as, as much as possible that that's going to be uh, in our CPU caches. Right? And you can sort of extend this further and obviously say you want to make sure that the data that you that you need read will be local memory to you, uh, but before you even get there, then you know th this is more important, and you want to try to uh, uh, maximize maximize the amount of cache affinity or cache reuse that, that you have. Yes. And what is the difference, like uh, comparing this book uh, you mentioned last class? What are we doing different here? Yeah, and you said they're different. So um, his question is. What is different about trying to maximize cache reuse to minimize cache misses versus maximizing uh, your access to local data? Yep. Um, so it's sort of like you could always just access data that is local to you, but you could still be jumping around to different parts of it and having all these cache misses, right? Like it is forbidden to jump like, in other places. His statement is, is it forbidden to jump to other places? It's not forbidden. And we'll see this in the, the, when we start doing partitioning, right? The, the end of the goal, the, the goal of partitioning is to have every local memory, right? And you can sort of think of that as, is it in my NUMA region, but even more fine grain, is it actually in my CPU caches? Does it fit my CPU caches? They're, they're, they're related together, right? But it's, if we're, we're going a little more fine grain than what we talked about before, right? All right, so, so, how do we actually improve our cache behavior? So the two factors that, that, that are going to affect what our cache, how many cache misses you have are obviously how much space we have in our CPU caches, right? L1, L2, L3, but then also how much uh, space we have for the TLB entries, right? The translation look inside buffer, right? So if you have uh, your threads just jumping around in memory, Again, ignoring whether it's in the same NUMA region or not, if you're just jumping around reading different locations in memory, then every single time you do a read at some location, it's going to be a cache miss. Uh, and depending if your TLB is full, it's going to be a, you know, another cache miss because you're not going to have a way to map the virtual page to the physical page. So essentially, for every bad read you do, you end up paying two, two cache misses. And that's going to be much, much slower than just having everything uh, local in your CPU caches to you. So this is affected by how the, the threads are actually going to access the data. And this can be in terms of the temporal location of one access to another and also the spatial location. So spatial location would be like, am I reading data that is, uh, is local to me or is, is close by? The temporal data would be like, if I have to read the same object or, or location uh, multiple times, I want to do that all together. I'm going to do all those, those operations uh, within the same uh, time window of each other because it's more likely to be in my CPU caches. So how, how we can handle this is that in, we have to deal with the two type of accesses we could possibly have during our, our join algorithm. So at first, you have a non-random access, and this would be like a sequential scan. So we can handle this by making sure that we try to cluster all the data that we're going to scan uh, in, in continuous order into a single cache line. And that way, when we bring in that data into our CPU caches, we do, again, all the operations we have to do on that data before it's then evicted because we moved on to something else. Right? We never want to go back and read something uh, that we've already processed before because then we've got to bring it back from memory into our CPU cache again. And then for random access, this is like you know, if, if you're doing a hash join, you're probing into the hash table. So ideally, we want to make sure that the, the, we, we split the data up 
so that it, it'll be able to fit in our CPU cache and our TLB. And again, we sort of related to this, we do all our processing on the partition, this chunk of data, before we move on to the next one. All right? So th this is the goal is we're going we're to try to achieve to get better performance uh, in our, in our hash, hash join algorithm. So as I said at the beginning, uh, the hash join is my opinion, the most important operator you can have in a database management system when you're doing OLAP workloads. Right? Again, we're not worried about OTP, we're not doing transactions here, we're really focusing on running complex queries that are scanning large segments of the database and joining multiple tables together. Right? So we're worried about TPCH, TPCDS, not TPCC or TPCE. So again, in order to get better performance, because the clock speeds aren't going up, we have to take advantage of all the additional cores that Intel and AMD are providing us. So we're going to try to, we need to come up with a join algorithm that can run in parallel. And the idea is that we want to have all the cores be always busy, always crunching on data, um, without them always getting blocked because they have cache misses and we always have to keep pulling data in from, from DRAM onto our, our CPUs. So to give you an idea how important hash join is uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a data warehouse system, uh, so this is, this is a, a, a measurement that I had a student do a few years ago where we were working with Impala, or working with the guys at Cloudera, uh, and doing some profiling on their system and try to understand where they're spending the time uh, when they execute queries and try to identify some, some, some opportunities to optimize things. And so this is running the, the TPCH workload, uh, all queries, all 22 queries on, on their system. And then we're breaking it down by the, the, the four major operators that, that, that you would execute, hash join, sequential scan, union operator, aggregation, and then all the other sort of miscellaneous thing. And for this, we're, we're measuring the, the CPU time spent in each of these operators. So Impala is a distributed data, data warehouse that's designed to run on HDFS. So there is, uh, there is some network transfer and network communication between the nodes in, in order to execute these operators. For that, we just ignore that. It's simply just the CPU time. So in this case here, hash join ends up being about 50% of the, of the total execution cost of queries for across all this workload. Right, so this is why we're going to focus on hash join and try to make this go as fast as possible, because this is the high pole in the tent. Now, the paper you guys read, uh, they had this little graph at the end where they say they take one query in TPCH, a Q19, which is a, just a two-way join, and they say that these black bands here represent the, the, the non-join part of the, of, the, of the query execution. So these little colored parts are the time they're saying you're, you're actually spending doing the hash join, then everything else is the, is the other parts of the query. Uh, I think this is an anomaly. Uh, we'd have, we haven't double-checked these results in our own system. Um, I think this would be correct for a two-way join, but for more complex queries, especially like in TPCDS, there's way more joins, and I suspect that th these numbers will be different. All right? So just this is what we've gotten, but this is what they reported. I just want to be upfront about that. Okay. So let's talk about what, what the hash join looks like. So a hash join can be broken up into three phases. So in the first phase, you do partitioning. And this is an optional phase, meaning you don't have to do this, and everything else will still be correct if you execute the, the, the second and third phase. Um, but the idea here is that you're going to take your two input relations, so you're trying to join our tables R and S, and you're going to divide them up into uh, partitions based on their join key. Uh, and then later on in the build phase, you'll have the threads as process on those local partitions. Right? Think of this like the morsel stuff that we talked about uh, last class. Then in the build phase, you scan the outer relation, in this case R, and you're going to build the hash table for, the, for that relation based on the join key. Then in the third phase, the probe phase, you do a sequential scan on the inner relation, S, and then you take its join key, you hash it in the same way that you hashed it in the build phase for the other table, then do a probe in the hash table to see whether there's a match, and if so, you combine the, the, the portion of R and put with portion of S, and you spit that out as your, as your output, right? It's pretty straightforward. So we're going to go through each of these phases one, uh, one by one. All right, so as I said, the, the partition phase, the idea is that we want to split our, both the input and the, the, the inner and the outer relations based on, into, into these partition buffers based on the, their join key. So the idea here is that for a given partition, right, from both tables, say there's partition one, 
then all the tuples of the same join key will exist in that first partition for the, for the outer table and the first partition for the, for the inner table. And then you never have to go check anything else from the other partitions because you've already sort of done this first pass to partition them into buckets. You haven't matched them yet. You still have to do the, the build and probe phase, but you know you don't need to check any, any other part of the hash table. So this seems kind of counterintuitive, right? That we're going to scan the data once from both relations, we're going to hash it, but then we're just going to copy the, uh, the, the result into these partition buffers. We're not actually going to do any join or build the hash table here. So this seems counterintuitive because, again, you're scanning the data and sort of just, just preparing it without actually doing the join. Um, but the argument or the, idea, the intuition why this actually might work is that the, if the cost of partitioning is going to be less than the cost of all the cache misses we would incur during the build phase from the threads just reading whatever they want, uh, then this will actually be, will be better. Right? Yes? Is it possible for uh, addition to like, or join key to expand multiple partitions? Your question is, is it possible for a, to span multiple partitions? Yes. How would that work? It's like, uh, it's a partition buffer fixed length. His question is, is the partition buffer think select? No. Okay. Right? So like, you have to be able to extend it. I mean, I'll, I think I'll have a graph in a second, or diagram. You have to be able to extend it, right? Because if you put it into another partition, then it's like, it's, you can't find it, right? And you, you would have a false negative. All right, so sometimes this approach is called the hybrid hash join, so like, or partition hash join. So th it, one of the things we'll see in these joins is a bunch of different names that people use, and essentially means what I'm describing here. So if you do partition, it's called a hybrid hash join. So what we actually put in our partition buffers can depend a lot on our storage model. So we're not going to talk about the trade-offs between early materialization or late materialization for this point here. Maybe on, on Monday I could talk about that. But the basic idea is that if we are a column store, then doing this partition phase is actually relatively cheap to do because we can just rip through our join columns and do the hashing and, and put them into partitions without reading unnecessary data. But if you're in a row store, you always have to read essentially the, the entire tuple, right? Because you have to jump to the, to the offset and that's going to bring a bunch of crap maybe you actually don't even need to, need to use for the, for the join. So in some cases, again, more than just saying, or in addition to just saying, you know, if, is my, uh, am I going to reduce some of my cache misses during the build phase? This part can be additionally expensive too if you end up reading more data than you actually need uh, because you're a row store versus a column store. All right, so this is another example. I think uh, we'll, we'll come up across this multiple times in today's lecture where if the query, the, the query optimizer can possibly figure this out for us because it knows what join we're doing, it knows what the distribution of the data looks like and the, and the selectivity of our join. So it could possibly identify in some cases, that you actually don't want to partition because uh, it's good, it, you're not going to get the benefit you think you possibly could. And we'll see later on when you actually have skewed workloads, partitioning this partitioning thing actually does, doesn't work because you end up having a partition that has all of the tuples or a large number of the tuples. So there's two ways to implement the uh, partitioning phase. The first approach is what I call non-blocking partitioning, where this is where you can have one set of threads scan through the, each, each table and hash the key and put it into, uh, uh, in, into the partitions. And then you can have another set of threads f be, being fed, fed those partitions and reading the tuples out and then start, start doing the build phase and building the hash table. Right? So when I say non-blocking, I don't mean the sense of like when we talk about concurrency control where readers don't block on writers and, and so forth. I just mean that we don't have to actually complete the partitioning phase entirely before we're allowed to start the, the build phase. And contrast this with the blocking partitioning approach where we, we may end up scanning the, 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 the table multiple times and we only materialize all of the results once each sort of pass is done. All right? So this is called a blocking partition because you have to get the block, you, have, you can't start the build phase until the partitioning phase is done. So the, one of the approaches we'll show how to, how to do this is called radix partitioning. So sometimes you also see in the literature, people will say they're using a radix hash join, right? This, this means that they're using this approach here. So I'll go through examples of both of these. 
So for non-blocking partitioning, there's a, there's a two sort of sub-approaches or sub-design sub -design decisions we have to deal with. Um, and the first approach is that we can do shared partitions where we have all the threads are running and they're writing into the same uh, set of partition buffers. And of course, that means we have to now be able to, to make sure we don't uh, mess up the integrity of the data structure. So we have to use compare and swap or latches to make sure that uh, the threads don't interfere with each other. And then the, last, the second approach is use private partitions where every thread will have their own set of sub-partitions. Then you sort of do one pass over the input table and populate those, 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 those private partitions. And then you go back through and each thread picks out just for one partition, they, they copy the data from all the different threads and write it out to a global partition. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll go through examples of both of these, but this is a good example where there's essentially no free lunch. In the same way we saw this with uh, the BW tree and a lock-free data structure, you end up doing more work uh, in order to claim your lock-free or latch-free. In the same way here, if, if you want to not have to synchronize your threads, you end up having to do more work and execute more instructions by going to do, going a second pass over the data for your partitions. All right, for shared partitions, let's say we have a, uh, a single table here, and we're going to do the same thing that we did with morsels, where we're going to divide it up into disjoint subsets and then have a thread running at a core be in charge of processing or partitioning the data at, the, at that partition. So let's say that for whatever query we're executing, the join key that we need to join this table with another table is this column B here. So what we're going to do is each thread is going to scan through uh, and look at every tuple and look at the value for this attribute here, and it's going to run it through a hash function, and the hash function has to be the same for all cores, and then it's going to, they're going to generate these global partitions, right? So assume we have n partitions. So the first guy here will he'll look at the first tuple, hash b, and then it'll tell you it goes to either partition 1, 2, or 3, or, or, or n, and then all the other cores are essentially doing the same thing. Right? And again, because these are global partitions, because they're shared, we have to use some kind of synchronization uh, primitive when we actually insert into our partitions uh, to make sure that we don't interfere with each other. And this can just be compare and swap. So these, this is not a hash table. This is just buffers, like blocks of, blocks of, of, of memory. All right, and there are, are, the things we're putting in them are fixed length, so we always know to how, to how to jump into some offset to find our next location to write it into. Yes? So is NUMA inefficient? His statement is, is this NUMA inefficient? Uh, yes, because the, this portion of the data can think of like morsels. This could be at some NUMA region, this could be at another NUMA region, and the, this thread will be processing on its local data, but then when it hashes it, it's going to write it out to anything. So yes, you, you, would, you would pay the penalty to go, to go over the interconnect to write it there. All right, so now with uh, private partitions, as I said, we're not going to have, at least initially, we're not going to have that global shared partition space. Every thread is instead going to have their own local set of partitions. Right? So now, again, this could be in the same NUMA region because this thread here would write to its, its, its local partitions. But the problem is now all our, our, all our, um, all our partitions are sort of, sort of subdivided into these smaller subsets across all the different cores. So in the next step, which we need to do, we need to combine these together. And the way we're going to do that is that we're going to have each core be responsible for you know, one level or one, one, one partition group. So the first thread here, he'll be in charge of partition one. So he's got to go into each, each memory region for these private partitions find where partition one is, and then write it out into the global combined partition one. And again, same thing, this would be, uh, this could, this output partition here, the combined one, this could be in your local NUMA region, but you're reading from, from disparate locations. So another thing also is to sort of say here is that the, this is, this is, in this example here, or actually just partitioning in general, this is, what, this is a good example of uh, dealing with the issues of what you're actually putting into these partitions. So you could just be copying the entire tuple, or you could be a little bit smarter and say, well, I only need to join on B, so maybe I can just have the, the join key be stored here plus the offset of, what, of where it corresponds in my, in my, in, in, in my, my fixed length data, uh, data blocks. Depending on what, how you actually, your storage is set up and actually what, what you put in here, this copying could be really expensive, it could be really cheap. 
But later on, when you need to stitch tuples back together, if you're not copying everything over, you may have to go back into the data table and read everything again. So again, it depends on what the join looks like. It depends on what the, the data looks like. All right, so let's talk about now a uh, blocking approach with a radix partitioning. So the idea here is that we're going to scan our input relations multiple times, and we're going to generate our partitions in a more sophisticated manner than the sort of the, 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 the join key stuff that I showed before. So at each pass uh, that we're going to take during the radix partitioning, uh, there's going to be three steps. So in the first step, we're going to scan through our, our table, and we're going to compute a histogram of the number of tuples that will get mapped to, uh, per hash key, that will get mapped to some radix at a given offset. So if you remember from the radix tree stuff we talked about when we talked about indexes, a radix is just like a digit in a, in a key. Right? If my number is 123, 1 would be a radix, 2 would be a radix, 3 would be a radix. Contrast this, though, with the radix tree was actually basing on the actual bits themselves. And for us here, we just worry about the actual uh, integer in a position. So we compute a histogram in the first step. Then we go, in the second step, we take this histogram and we compute the starting location of where uh, we're going to start writing data in a, in a global partition uh, at a given offset based on the prefix sum. And I'll, I'll show what a prefix sum is in, in a second. And then once we have these, these, these starting points, we scan through our table again and now partition them based on the hash key using the prefix sum that's telling us where the starting point is. So again, I'll go through all of these one by one and then the, the prefix sum and the radix is really easy to understand and then you'll put it all together to actually do the radix partitioning and it's actually really easy. All right, so again, the radix is just the value of a, of a particular digit in an integer at a particular position, right? So if I have uh, keys 89, 12, 23, 0, or 8, 41, and 64, the, the radix in the first partition, uh, the first position is just these digits here, so 9, 2, 3, 8, 1, 4, and the radix at the second, second position is just the first, first digit, 8, 1, 2, 0, 4, 6. Right, again, this is different than the radix tree, which was based on bits of an actual integer key. Now we're just actually pacing it on like, in your, the tens position. And so now the prefix sum is just a running summation of, uh, of a sequence of keys. So we have a, uh, the prefix sum we define is it starts with a sequence of input numbers, and then it's going to output a, a second sequence of numbers, which is, which is the running total of the values going from this, from one, in one direction by adding together what was the, the sum of the previous position with the, with the key at that my current position. So if I start at 1, right, this is my first position here, the prefix sum is just 1 because there's nothing that came before it, so there's nothing to add it to, so it's you know, essentially 0 plus 1 equals 1. But now for the second position, 2, I take the prefix sum of the previous position add it together with my key here, and that's the, the, the computer prefix sum. So 1 plus 2 equals 3. And I just keep doing this down the line and add them all together, and now I have my, my sequence of prefix sums. Right, is this clear? And then what we'll end up doing is we'll use this as, again, to say, all right, I know I had uh, three entries here, so my starting point where we actually want to start writing data would be the, the value of this. All right. So to do radix partitioning, uh, for this, I'm going to keep it simple and say these are just the, 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 hash, the hashes of the keys after we've already hashed them, right? So it's the, not the actual join key itself, it's the hash of the join key. So in the first step here, uh, we're going to have each thread come along and just scan through the data that they're responsible for. So sort of think of this as, as the dividing line. The first thread will look at the first four uh, keys the second thread to look at the, the second four keys. And they're going to create a histogram that's going to tell us, again, how many keys will correspond to a given, given partition. So we start with the first radix, right, in this position here, and we're just going to look at each one and say, all right, this goes to partition zero, this goes to partition one, partition one, partition zero. So we just go through and read all these one by one and compute our histogram like this. So this says now at thread 0, or CPU 0, partition 0, based on the first radix, will have two entries. Partition 1, again, based on uh, the radix here, will have two entries. 
partition uh, zero at CPU zero, so CPU one will have one entry at partition zero, and C partition one will have three entries. So now we can then compute our prefix sum based on these histograms, and this is going to tell us where each, th each thread should start writing the data for the, the entries that appear at that partition. Right? So for partition zero at CPU zero, the prefix sum is zero because there's nothing that came before it, so we start there. For partition zero CPU one, the prefix sum is, or so partition zero CPU one, it's one plus whatever is before us, which is two, so our position is three. So we can just go through now and scan through our partition, and it'll tell us we use this as a way to write into, uh, into this giant partition space here. So we don't have to coordinate between the different threads, right? After everyone blocks, you sort of, everyone has to block until you everyone computes their histogram. Once you have that, then they can go ahead and now start writing into this because they know nobody else has been writing into the, into the same location. And all you need to do is maintain an internal counter that says, all right, well, if I'm writing another tuple back to the partition where I started that before, how many things have I already put in there? So we can do this again. We can do recursively keep partitioning this so that we generate uh, partitions at the right size. Typically, you want these to be able to fit in your CPU caches. So we keep doing essentially the same process all over again. But then before, in the first pass, we start at the first position. So in the second pass, we will start at the, at the, the, the second radix position. And we just do the same thing. We just scan through and split everything up and, and generate another group of partitions. So is this clear? Blank faces, yes. If we need to do like modular operations, if there is like three, let's say in the first place. Your question is, do we need to do modular operations? Yes. What do you mean by that? Like, like zero, position zero, one position one, but what if there is a three? Oh, yeah, so. Yeah, he, so, so you, you, you have to know how many partitions you have ahead of time. So I, I'm oversimplifying this. You essentially take this, this, this hash key and you mod it by the number of partitions you would have. So yeah, zero mod n, one mod n, and the same thing over here, right? Seven mod n, right? Yeah, you do that, yes. I should, I should add that. All right, so at this point, Again, the partition phase is optional, and I've showed two ways to do this. We can do the non-blocking way, we either share partitions or private partitions, or the blocking way using radix partition, um, which then can, you can operate on uh, as you go along into uh, memory that's local to each, each thread. So I would say that, you can, in theory, you can keep doing this recursively over and over again for every single radix partition, but uh, in the literature, nobody does more than two passes. And I also say, as a spoiler, in practice, nobody actually does this in a real system, as far as we know. All right. All right. So now we get to the build phase. And as I said, again, our threads now are going to scan over the the outer table in our uh, in, in our join. And this could be either the actual base table itself, or if we ran through the partitioning phase, it'd be the partitions of tuples. And then for every single tuple we have, we have to hash it again on the join key and then put it into uh, the appropriate bucket or, or slot in our, our hash table. And ideally, we want to have it so that our buckets are only a few cache lines of size, so that anytime we have to read a bucket, uh, we're not you know, paying a huge penalty for reading a, a lot of data. Right? We try to keep things in our cache lines so we can come in and out very quickly. So the, the major design decision we have to deal with in the build phase is how the hell we're actually going to build our hash table. And the two design decisions within that are what hash function we're going to use and what hash, hash, hashing scheme we want to use. So the combination of these two things essentially defines what a hash table actually is. So in the first case of the hash function, the basic idea here is that we want to be able to map a, a potentially large key space into a smaller domain um, because we don't want to have, we don't want to just have to be able to have to allocate a, you know, every possible, uh, a slot for every single possible key that could ever exist in our domain for the join key. So the hashing function is a way to sort of condense this. So there's this classic trade-off of speed versus collision rate when you choose a hash function uh, that we're going to have to deal with here. So the way you sort of think about this is the fastest hash function you could ever possibly have 
is just return one, right? No matter what, what key you give it, just return one. That's, it's, it's the fastest possible thing you do. The problem is your collision rate will be terrible because for every possible key, the hash is one, right? Uh, and as we'll see when we talk about the, the, the hashing schemes, having a really bad collision rate is expensive because now you're going to have to essentially generate these you know, linked lists or do these scans to actually find the key that you're potentially looking for. And so if you have a really bad collision rate, then it, everything ends up being a sequential scan, which is the thing we want to avoid in the first place by building a hash table. In the hashing scheme, uh, the, the main idea of what we're, we're going to do here is we're going to decide how we're actually going to handle key collisions after we've already hashed them with our function here. And again, this is this trade-off between allocating the largest possible hash table you could ever have so that there's never a collision versus having to execute additional instructions if we have a smaller hash table because we have collisions. Right? Again, using my example before, if I hash everything to, to, to one, then my hash table will always put everything in the same slot and therefore, I have to do a linear scan to find the thing that, that I actually want. Um, another way to sort of also think about too, in the hash function as well, you could build in the other extreme from sort of hashing everything to one is you can have what's called a perfect hash function, where every unique key generates a perfect unique hash function. Um, this is more of a theoretical thing. Like in theory, you could build this uh, using another hash table, but in theory, you could build this, but it would be expensive to do. And every single time you add a new key, uh, that you need to include in your domain, then you maybe have to build the, 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 the rebuild your, your, your hash function. So nobody actually does that either. So we're trying to approximate things and, and it's a trade-off between uh, these, these issues here. So in terms of selecting a hash function, uh, the key thing to remind, remind ourselves is that we're doing joins here. So we don't care about security. I often say on video that I don't care about security. One day it's going to burn me. That's fine. Uh, but we don't care about any kind of cryptic cryptographic guarantees in our hash function. We just want to have you know, something be fast and have low collision rate. So that means that we're not going to want to use like SHA-256 or MD5, right? all those sort of classic uh, security hash functions. It really is just doing something that we can do internally, and we don't worry about leaking information. Yes? So even if we care, like using a cryptographic hash function would not help us, right? So the statement is, if, if we did care about security, yeah. uh, using cryptographic ha hash function would not help us. For like average average. Uh, it, 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 yeah, if, if you never leak the hash outside the system, then yeah, it's, it doesn't help you either. I mean, in the case of like SHA-256 and other, these, other, um, or these other hashing functions, some of them are meant to be two-way. So like for a given encryption key, I can take a, I can take a hash function, or take a key, I take a value, hash it, and I can actually reverse it. We don't care about that. We only care about one-way hashes. Yeah. So this is a, a summary of the sort of the, the major hash functions that people use now uh, in, in existing systems. Um, we actually reached out to a bunch of different companies and asked them what they use uh, in their systems. Oracle wouldn't tell us, but it's something proprietary internal. Uh, Murmur hash actually turns out to be the most popular, or, or CRC, which I should have included, but that's fine. So Murmur hash was this hash function that put out in 2008 by this random dude on the internet. He just put the source code out, and then people picked up it and said, oh, this is actually pretty good uh, for a lot of different things, and in particular, it was really good for joins. So then Google took some of the ideas that, that from Murmur hash 2, and they created something called city hash. And what was interesting about city hash is that it was it was tweaked so that it could be faster to hash short keys, or keys that are less than 64 bytes. And Google wanted to do this because for their different some of their application domains, they had keys that were less than this, this size. And so they could get better performance by being careful about how they align things and how they actually do the digest. And so it would, they came up with a hash function derived from Murmur hash, but that was was better performance for this. And then later on, they had a newer version of city hash called farm hash that was designed to have better collision rates. There's another, uh, Google released another hash function called highway hash in, uh, in 2016. Um, I, as far as I know, you don't want to use this for joins because it has sort of cryptographic uh, guarantees about uh, being difficult to infer anything from the keys. But again, we don't care about for that for our joins. The last one here, so I would say, so Murmur hash is often used in systems 
CRC is also used as well. Steady hash is, is good for some systems. I think uh, I, mean, I know I think one system uses this, but then nobody uses these other ones here. This last one is CL hash, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, so this was uh, created by a researcher in Canada, David Daniel Lemire. Um, and what's really interesting about it is based on a different kind of math than all these other other hash functions. It's based on something that's called carry less multiplication. Um, the the interesting thing about it is that it's only in the last three years did AMD and Intel add instructions that make carry less multiplication actually perform really well. So now that they added these new instructions, it's now possible to do something like CL hash and get, get better performance than some of these other ones for some situations. So this is a uh, this is a benchmark framework that I found on the internet a few years ago, uh, and then I tweaked it to be able to support CL hash and some other things. Uh, so this is actually, I ran this last night on my brand new, as of January 2018, machine uh, workstation. So this is a Core i7-8700. Um, and so this, what this experiment is doing is comparing a bunch of different hash functions, computing hashes for keys of different sizes. So the y-axis here is the throughput in terms of the, the amount of data we're processing per second. Right? It's not the number of hashes we're actually doing. Um, so what you see here is that... Uh, for smaller key sizes, everyone's pretty much the same. Uh, Murmur hash and, and standard, standard template library hash, they're roughly about the same, although Murmur hash is, is, is a little bit slower. But then you see these giant sawtooth patterns for city hash and farm hash, um, where they're doing really, really good, and then they drop down and go down and get worse, and they go do really good again. And then they have the longer uh, sawtooth pattern going this way. Yeah, let me take a guess what, what, what these different spikes represent. What's that? Right, yeah, these, these are the, uh, of the, of the key sizes of a certain byte. And everything's sort of cache lined uh, nicely up to this point. And then you go down and have to allocate more memory for their buffers. Right, and then you, you do it again up to here. And then I don't, actually don't know why the, the pattern, I, right, well, because that's not powers of two. Yeah, 64, by, 64 bytes after that point. So, yes. Are these fast enough that you wouldn't worry about like memoizing the hash values if you were doing one of those partitioning schemes and you initially like scan everything to the hash values? So his question is a good question. His question is, are these things so fast that you actually wouldn't even bother trying to memoize anything because because that just wastes extra space? Absolutely, yes. As far as I know, nobody mem memoizes to do hash joins. Um, if you throw CL hash in the mix, uh, it's it's much more interesting. Um, so again, you see this sort of spiky pattern. Again, I guess that's based on uh, alignment. Uh, when you're less than 64, 64 bytes, it's slower. But then beyond that, for large, larger key sizes, it does uh, really, really well. So the practicality of this, I think, is limited because typically when you're doing joins in, a, in an OLAP database, you know, most of the time you'll be joining on compressed data, like dictionary codes. So you're going to be eight bytes. Um, so having, you know, it's very rare that I think you would actually do uh, joins on really large keys. Um, but this is just sort of showing you that some, there is some interesting patterns for larger key sizes. All right, so, yes? How large is their, like, output size? This question, how large is the output size? I ask a question. I, it's either 32 bits or 64 bits. All right. It's probably 64 bits. And then you can mod that by the number of partitions or, or the number of slots in your hash table. All right, so now that we have a hash function, uh, we have to have put it in something, right? So this is what we, people typically call the hash table, but in the paper they call it it's a hashing scheme, right? The idea here is that we, it's, the, it's the method or the heuristics or the, or the protocol we're going to have in our hash table that we're going to use to define when we have a collision. When we have two things hashed to the same location in our hash table, what, how do we actually deal with that? So we'll talk with chain hash tables, linear hash tables, which is the most, the most common ones, and then we'll talk about two variants of linear hashing uh, called Robin Hood and Cuckoo hashing. So chain hashing is the what people most people think of when they think of a hash table, uh, where you have these slots that then have pointers to essentially a linked list of buckets, and then when you hash something, you land in a slot, you follow the, the, the pointer to the first bucket, and then you find where a free slot is to, in that bucket to, to store your tuple, right? And the idea here, again, is that when we have a collision, we just keep appending to, our, to, to the, the bucket. And if the bucket gets full in our linked list, we go on and make a new one. 
So the way you determine when you do a probe is to figure out whether a key is actually already exists. You hash it to the, to the bucket location, and then you just do a linear scan or a sequential scan of every single tuple in, your, in the buckets until you find the one you're looking for, or you reach the end, and therefore you know it's not in there. Right? And assertion is, is basically the, the same thing as, as this. So this is what you get when you use um, uh, like the STD unordered map uh, in C++. And if you jo use Java util hash map, you get a change hash table like this. So at a high level diagram, it looks like this. Again, so we, we take our key, we hash it, mod by the number of, uh, of slots in our table, and then this would have a, uh, a pointer to the, the first entry in our, in our list of buckets. And then we just go find either the, the free slot if we're doing an insert, or we find the key that we're looking for as we go along. All right, it's pretty, pretty basic to understand. The other approach is to use what's called, a, sort of the, these are from a broader class of hash tables or hashing schemes called open addressing. Um, and the most prevalent one is called linear hashing, where instead of having these linked lists of buckets, we're just going to have a giant uh, array, a giant table of slots. And then when we hash our key, we mod by the number of slots, and that's going to take us to a position in this hash table. And if that position is empty, then we can go ahead and put our key right in there, we're done. If it's full, then we basically do now, we iterate down through, the, through the, all the positions until we find a free slot. So now what happens is that when we uh, want to find our key, we actually need to make sh actually do a comparison to make sure we're actually seeing the key that we're looking for. Right, so that means we have to restore some extra metadata in, our, uh, in the hash table so that we know that we're actually looking at exactly the thing that we expect to see because something else from another position could be in, in, in the position we're looking at. Right? And then we also need to keep track of what key we started off with because potentially we could scan through the bottom, wrap around to the top, and get back to where we started before. And if we don't know that we've already gone through and seen everything, then we can do this infinitely. So we need a mechanism to tell us when to stop. So at a high level, it looks like this. So now let's say that we're going to hash, uh, we have uh, six keys we want to put in here. Right? So again, the first step, you basically uh, say we want to start with A, you hash it mod by the number of, of slots, and then that's going to tell us where we actually go. So in here now, inside of our hash table, we have to store the original hash value of the thing we just, we just, we just hashed, as well as the original key value as well. Right? And we do this because we need to know uh, when we're actually seeing the thing we're looking for, and when we've, uh, uh, when we've gone past uh, far enough and we're not going to see anything else. All right, so B would hash like this. In the case of C, now it hashes to the same location as A. So again, since A is already occupied there, you leave it alone, and you go down to the next slot, and you put your, you put your uh, key in there. Same thing for D. It wants to go where C is, so it goes down to the next one. E goes here. It wants to go here where A is, so we go, we go all the way down and put ourselves down here, and then F goes here, and it goes there. Right? So again, you do a lookup. If I want to look up on... Uh, E, I would do a hash on E, that would land here, and I would scan through and say, I haven't seen a, um, I don't find the thing I'm looking for, and I know that I haven't gone past the slot where I should be yet, right? So I keep scanning down, and then I find the thing that I want. You know, do, doing a linear scan until I find the thing I want, or if I was looking for a key that uh, wasn't in this list here, if I reach the empty slot, then I know I've, my keys not, can't be in there, so I, I can terminate my search. So, um, and so actually for this one, you don't need to synchronize with a latch or anything. You just do compare and swap and try to take, take a slot. If you succeed, you're in. If, if you don't, then you go down and move to the next one. So the, the issue with linear hashing is that uh, we're going to have a lot of wasteful computations, right? If we have a lot of collisions, then we're going to have these really long sequences of of slots with different uh, keys in them, and then when we land and look for the key we're looking for, we may have to do a bunch of evaluations to find the thing that, that we actually want. So one way, again, to reduce this is just have a really large hash table so that our collision rate is low, uh, but then this ends up taking, uh, you know, you end up wasting space. And this is also why the reason why when we saw this in the, in the joint ordering benchmark paper, 
they talked about how with Postgres, if it, if it underestimated the size of the, of the output or the selectivity of the join operator, it would, it would allocate a hash table that ended up being too small, then had to go ahead and re, resize it, right? They're using a linear hashing approach where essentially all the slots get full, uh, and you can't insert anything else into it, so you have to then double the size of it and make it bigger, which again, you have to block all the threads from accessing it while you're doing this because you don't want any false negatives or false positives. So let's look at some other approaches to deal with this, these, these collisions, right? The linear hashing is super simple, right? You, you check to see whether something's in there, if, if yes, then you go on to the next slot, right? So one approach to handle, uh, uh, to, be, to be even more sophisticated about your collisions is to call Robinhood hashing. So this is a paper from, from 1985. So this, this is an older technique, um, but it sort of showed up on Hacker News a couple of years ago, so it's, it's back in vogue. Um, and the basic idea here is that we're gonna do linear hashing just like before, where we have, again, a giant list of slots, and we try to hash to a location, and if, and if it's not there, we, we, then we move on to a slot below it. But the idea is that we're gonna keep track of the number of positions or number of steps away every key is from where its optimal location, and like where it, sh it should have been if you hashed it. And then as we're inserting, try to insert a new key, if we notice that the, uh, if, if the key we're trying to insert is farther away from where it should be from some key that already exists, then we can go ahead and steal that position and then take the, 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 the key out and put it, put it down below somewhere else. So it's called Robin Hood because you're gonna steal, steal the slots from the rich keys, meaning the ones that are closer to where they should be, and you give them to the poor keys, the ones that are farther away, right? So let's look at an example like this, right? So we, we start with A, we hash A, then we, you know, we have to store the hash location of our slot, we have to store the original key, but now we're also gonna include this number of jumps from the first position, or, or the optimal position, where it should be. So in this case of A, our hash table is empty when we started, so we're at, we have zero steps from where we should be, right, because we're exactly uh, where we hashed into. Same thing for B up here, right, it's hashed right into its, its slot, so its position is zero. So now when we hash in C, now we do a comparison and say, well, A's already in here, so is it, is it richer or poorer than I am? So in this case here, C hasn't put, been put into the table yet, and it hasn't jumped down any, 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 any positions, so its current position offset is zero. A's position offset is zero. So in this case here, we're gonna leave, C, leave A alone and move C down here. But now we set its position offset to one because it's one, you know, one jump away from where it should have been. Then we get to D. D wants to go in here. C has a, again, offset of one, and that's going to be greater than D, which hasn't gone into the table yet, so its, it's offset is zero. So D is going to have to end up going down here. So now we get to, to E. E wants to hash in where A is. So again, we do the same thing at the beginning. A's offset is zero, E's offset is zero, so we leave A alone. Uh, now we get to this next step here. C's offset is one, E's offset is one. So they're equivalent, so we leave C alone. So then we get to D. D's offset is one, because it should have been where C is now, but now we've gone two jumps from where E should be, so E's offset is two, so E is considered poorer than D, so it's gonna club them over the head and steal its, steal its position. So E ends up going in here, right, and with, with offset two, because it's, you know, zero, one, two, and then D ends up getting put down to here now with also set two. Right, and the idea here is that we're trying to sort of yeah, amortize the, 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 the number of, of, of the, the length of the scans we're gonna have to do to find particular keys uh, by averaging out the, the distance from every key to its optimal position. So in the case of F, right, F would, would, would once go over here, it's, its position, D's position offset is two, F at this point is zero, so F would have to go down in here, right? Yes? Uh, in terms of the hashing ability, why is that set? Like, uh, the chain hashing requires two time space in the last observation. Your question is why would, why would chain hashing require? Two time space. In so, it, so in, in, in practice, on average, if you have twice this number, if you have twice the number of slots, then the 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 number of keys that you could possibly have 
then that has some you know, theoretical minim minimization of the number of, of steps you have to do. It's like heuristic. Yes, yeah, it's heuristic, yes. Right, it's, it's, it's the probabilistic data structure in some ways because you're hashing this and you're, and you're landing in, you know, it's not probabilistic, but it's, it's not an exact thing like a, like a linked list where you know every, where everything should be. Because right, the hash function is going to end up taking a large key domain, map it down to a lower key domain, and the probability that you're going to have a collision depends on a whole bunch of different things. So this seems kind of cool, right? Problem is it actually doesn't, in practice, for joins, this actually doesn't work out really well. Uh, and because you end up with more branch mispredictions, every time you do an insert, you have to you know, figure out what's going on and figure out where you need to go. Uh, and, and you do, do these evaluations to decide whether you should steal a slot from somebody else. Um, and you end up doing more copying because now every, you, know, you could possibly be flipping around every single position just to, you know, what was, could have been just one insert now has ended up being multiple inserts. Um, so the, the, the current literature shows that this actually, for joins and modern uh, CPUs, Robinhood hashing is, is not actually a good approach. Um, semester, and he talked about how they were using uh, Robinhood hashing, I believe, for their joint algorithm. We asked him why. I think they said they saw it on Hacker News and thought it was a good idea. Um, <laughs> but that's fine. I think like I said, it, it, seem, you know, it seems like this would work, but it, it, again, for, for current CPUs, it doesn't. Okay, the other approach to deal with collisions is called cuckoo hashing. And the idea here is that we, instead of having to, you know, one giant hash table and have to deal with when we have a collision, how to jump down and find a, a slot to where we put something, we're actually going to maintain multiple hash tables with multiple hash functions. And then when we do an insert, we, we try to find a free slot in either one or two of those hash tables. If we can't, then we end up stealing uh, a, a position from somebody else and then we move them back to another hash table. So the idea is that you sort of, you're going back and forth all the time uh, whenever you have to deal with collisions. So uh, in practice, the lookups are always going to be always 01 because when you hash a key, you're guaranteed that it's going to be, if it exists, it's going to be either one of, the two, one of the two hash functions. So you don't have to do any linear scans to find something. But it's going to make inserts potentially more expensive because you may have to cycle through and, and reshuffle everything in order to end up with a free slot. So let's look at an example here. So let's say in this case here, I have two hash tables. Um, and the first thing I want to do is insert key X. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two hash functions that have to be completely separate. Um, so what I mean by that, they both can be like murmur hash or city hash. You just salt them with a different random key so that they have a diff different mapping of a key, key to a, a location. So for, if we hash key, or hash x, uh, for the first hash function, we would land at this position here. For the second hash function, you would land at this, this position here. And you flip a coin, and you decide that I'm going to end up writing it over here. So now I, I want to insert y, same thing. I hash it twice. Uh, the, the first hash function maps to this position here in the first hash table. But x is, is, is currently occupied there. But then in the second hash table, the slot is free. So we can go ahead and put it there, right? No problems. So now let's see the case where we could have uh, collisions on both sides. So we, ha we have, we want to insert z. The first hash function will map us to where x is. The second hash function will map us to where y is. So we end up now need to steal one of these uh, two positions and replace the current occupant with our key and then figure out where to put that key we just took out somewhere else. So let's say that we decide to steal from the second hash table. So we take y out, put z in there, and then now we're going to go figure out where to put y in this hash table. So we're going to use the first hash function to now map it to a slot here. But as I showed in the beginning, and when we tried to insert it the first time, the first hash function maps it to the, the position where x is stored. So we have to do what we did before. Now y is going to st steal x's position. And now we have to, to take x and throw it on the other, other hash table. So now we hash that, and it ends up up in here. So at this point here, our insert is done, because both z, z, y, and x are put back into the hash table. Is this clear? So uh, just like in linear hashing, uh, you have to make sure that you don't get stuck in an infinite loop. right? You have to keep track of, in my example here, if I went back around and, and 
with x and x wanted to go where z was, uh, I would take z out and put x in, but now I'm back where I started before, where I need to do something with z, and z is going to map to positions that are already occupied. So we got to keep track of, if we're stuck in an infinite loop, then we have to stop the world and re rebuild our hash tables, possibly make it bigger, using two different new hash functions and essentially reshuffle everything. Right? And hopefully, in that, the second time around, you know, we won't have this problem of, of, of getting stuck in an infinite loop. So the way the theory works out is that if you have two hash functions, essentially two hash tables, then you probably don't need to rebuild the table until you're roughly about 50% full. Uh, but if you have three hash tables, three hash functions, then you probably don't need to re rebuild the table until it's about 90% full. But again, you're paying the, the, the storage penalty of having three hash tables um, to avoid having to re rebuild things. So, this, so, so uh, what I'll say is, as far as I know, nobody actually uses the Robinhood hashing or the Cuckoo hashing for hash joins. Everyone pretty much does the linear hashing because it's just so fast in, in, mo in most scenarios. All right, so now we get to the probe phase. All right, and the probe phase is pretty straightforward. Again, you just have uh, your threads scan through the, the inner relation, either again, the partitions or the base table, and then you hash the join key, probe your hash table, and then if you have a match, then that's, that's emitted out from the operator as, as, as part of the join, right? Um, and if, if this is actually not true, I mean, you don't have to technically, you have to synchronize at the beginning of the cursors if you just divide everyone up to start of different parts, um, but it's not like at every, every single step you have to um, synchronize. So there's one optimization you can do for the, the probe phase. Um, and this is where you, during the build phase, you're going to build a bloom filter for the, your, your, your hash join keys. And then when you go through the, the probe phase, as you're scanning through the interrelation, you actually check the bloom filter first to see whether you have a match. If not, then you know you don't need to go even check the hash table because the bloom filter will, could have false positives, but it'll never have false negatives. And then if it, if, it, if it does match, then you know you also go check and try to do the join in, in, the, uh, in the table itself. So in the literature, this is sometimes called sideways information passing because we're basically taking information from one side of our query plan and passing it along to the other side as, as a lateral, lateral move. Right? So let's say I'm joining A and B. I, I do my uh, build phase on, on A and my probe phase on B. So in the build phase, I generate my hash table, but then I'm also going to generate this bloom filter. And then when I'm done, I pass it over to the, the, the probe side, and B will always check the bloom filter first for, for attached join key. If it has a match, then it also get, goes and actually does the check into the, um, in, into the actual hash table itself. And the idea here is that because the bloom filter will be really small, right, it'll be able to fit in our CPU caches. So if we have a really low selectivity, meaning most table, most tuples from will not be able to match during the join, then going and checking the bloom filter is way faster than going and having to do a, a probe in the hash table and possibly do a linear scan to go find uh, the tuple that we're looking for. So we actually support this in, in Peloton. Uh, this is also was implemented in Vectorwise. This is one of the big benefits that Vectorwise had over other systems. And for we've done experiments where this roughly gives about a 2x performance improvement for if you have really selective joins. If most of your joins are not going to match, uh, then doing this is, is, is faster. If you, most of your tuples will match, then this is essentially just wasted work because you're, you're going to find a match in here anyway. All right, so let's get to now the evaluation of this in the remaining time. So I'll, I'll sort of go through this quickly, but uh, this is going to be from the paper from uh, the Wisconsin guys in 2011. It's a bit dated, but what I like about it is that they break it down into all the different pieces that we talked about uh, in this class. So they're going to do no partitioning, shared partitioning, private partitioning, and radix partitioning. Um, and they're going to compare on a synthetic workload where the, uh, the outer table is going to have 16 million tuples and the inner table is going to have 206, 256 million tuples. Um, and they're going to compare against the uh, uniform and highly skewed distribution. And then, as I said before in the beginning, this is not a true, this is not exactly how uh, a real data system would do a join because they're not materializing the output tuples. 
right? They're not doing that extra copy, which could, could be a bottleneck. They just do the join, they see they have a match, and then throw, throw the result away. So in the first, uh, first experiment here, they're doing a uniform data set. Uh, so that means that the, the, the radix partitioning, the partitioning approaches, should actually be beneficial because now you're going to divide the, the, the tuples up evenly across the different threads, and each of them can process them in, in parallel. So in this case here, you see that the, the, the radix partitioning actually performs the best, and the no partitioning uh, actually performs the second best. So the reason why the radix partitioning is performing better is because uh, if you don't partition your data, then in the build and probe phase, you end up having three times more cache misses and 70 times more TLB misses because every, every thread is just sort of reading random segments and when it does the probes, uh, and you just, oh, you just have way more cache misses here. But now, if you have a skewed data set, the, the no partitioning work actually performs the best because although, yes, there's going to be more, uh, more, more cache misses, uh, the, you don't end up partitioning the data set such that there's some large partitions that have all the tuples and only one or small number of threads could process them. So in this case here, the, the, the no partitioning approach is actually twice as fast as, as the Radex one and, and much, much faster than, these, than, than the, uh, the shared partitioning, the private partitioning approach. So I would say in practice, again, although the paper may, may, may suggest that the, you do want to partition for joins, if you want to handle possibly everything, the no partitioning one actually works the best, and this is what most systems actually do. Yes? His question is, is it too much work to, I mean, it's pretty much no partitioning or radix partitioning. Like, do you want to do those? Um, his question is, is it too much inter inter engineering to actually implement uh, both of them and have the optimizer switch on versus another? I would say probably yes, right? Like, I don't have, I don't have, um, I have graphs, but I don't have in the talk here. There are some situations where like Robinhood hashing might be better than linear hashing, uh, or cuckoo hashing might be better than other ones, right? Or different hash functions could be different, totally different. It, it's just too much work to be able to figure out, you know, have, have, have to implement all of them and then have the optimizer figure out, oh, I actually want to use, use this one. So most of the times it's, you're just better off just picking one hashing scheme, one hash function, and really implement it, implement it really well. Yes? But probably, like, private partitioning takes more time than no partitioning. His question is, why does private partitioning take more time in, in the, uh, the partitioning? Like, the proper phase takes more time. Sorry, is it, wh wh why is this larger than this? Yeah, like, the third one larger than the first one. Why is this larger than this? Yeah. Um, for what part, the, the partition phase or the, or the probe phase? Um, again, so, so there's, there's, what, 12 threads here? So it could be the case that if it's, if it's skewed, then some partitions will have most of the tuples. So you could have two threads be just be, you know, trying to process way more data and all, all your other threads are idle. Because they burn through their partitions and they're done, but then the other threads still have to g get finish their partitions because it's skewed. And isn't it like fair enough to like not the uh, material partition phase since like you have to do it like no matter what hashes get you? His question is: Is it okay for these papers for them to to ignore the materialization uh, process phase because? Regardless of what scheme you would use, uh, you would have to do that anyway. Um, yes, ex I mean, that's true, except that uh, it does affect uh, how much cache is available to you. Because you're copying the data out, right? And that, and that means there's less, there's less cache available for the, the join algorithm itself. His question is, would it vary, could it vary in terms of different partitioning schemes? Yes. Because some of these are more cash friendly than others. OK. Um, we're mostly out of time, but I'll sort of finish up here. So this, there's a bunch of stuff we're ignoring. 
uh, that I didn't talk about, but these are the things you do have to worry about when you actually implement, implement this real. I didn't talk about how, you know, we talked about whether you want to use partitioning or not. That's a hard question. Uh, but then we didn't talk about how many partitions you actually want to use. If you're using radix partitioning, how many passes you want to do. The answer is usually one. Um, and as, as we talked about before, the optimizer could select these different values uh, based on its estimations of what these operators actually do, but that's based on its, its, its statistics or sampling. So, which we saw in the case of, of the joint ordering benchmark paper, they get, they get this way wrong, they're always underestimating. So that can, you know, that's part of the reason why they're getting bad performance, right? So yes, these things are important, but figuring them out uh, reliably is really hard. All right, so I'm going to skip uh, sort of the remaining of these, but this is just this is this graph is just showing you that if you take one pass versus two pass for the uniform data set, or even for the skewed data set, you can end up with wildly different uh, uh, results. And then this last one here is just showing you that the no partitioning approach is actually less sensitive to hyperthreading, whereas the Reddick partitioning is. And this is because in the case of Reddick partitioning, um, yes, you are. You're going to get better performance because you have fewer cache misses, but this is going to make you be more uh, uh, CPU bound rather than uh, memory bound or cache, 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 limited by cache misses. So that makes you more sensitive to hyperthreading because whereas in the uh, no partitioning approach, you can have your two threads running on a single core. One thread could, could hit a cache miss, the other thread could actually do some computation and make forward progress. But if you're not you're, if you're minimizing your number of cache misses with partitioning, then hyperthreading doesn't help you as much. And that's essentially what I'm, what I'm saying here. Okay, to finish up. Uh, so I would say that the, the, it's oftentimes there's a bunch of papers that say here's a bunch of complicated ways to do hash joins. We actually tried to spend the last semester doing, doing this. It turns out the most simplest thing works the best. Right, a you know a reasonably hash hash reasonably fast hash function uh, with open address and hashing or linear hashing does really well. Hopscotch stuff does, doesn't help. Or not ignore hopscotch. Uh, Robinhood hashing doesn't help. The cuckoo hashing doesn't help. Just open address hashing. Yes, you have more collisions, but but it just works. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that we'll talk about later that you can actually vectorize. Uh, there's ways to vectorize the operations you're doing during the hash join, but we'll talk about that later on in, in when we talk about vectorized execution. The one thing I'll say about this is, again, this is another example where if everything fits in our CPU caches, we can do really, really fast. As soon as we have to go to, and we can vectorize everything, as soon as you have to go to memory, that's when things fall apart. So there is one technique we can do uh, called software prefetching, which is in a paper that Prashant wrote, you'll read in, uh, in a few weeks. That does help for some things, but not for, for hash joins. Okay? All right, any questions? Yes? Why did we consider dynamic hashing schemes such as uh, extended hashing? So the question is, why, didn't, why did we not consider dynamic hashing schemes like extendable hashing or linear hashing for our, our, our joint algorithms? Uh, because the, the, the cost of maintaining those things is, is too expensive. So the idea that you pick a hash table size and you hope, cross your fingers, that you're not going to have to rebalance it. So it's not worth the overhead of dynamically building those things out. Right? Those are, you know, those extendable hashing, linear hashing, those are, are incremental uh, dynamic hash tables. So like you start up with nothing and then you start inserting things and then you have to reshuffle as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So in these environments, it's just fatter to, faster to have a static hash table size and you hope everything fits in there and then, because that that'll get you better performance. Yes. What if the hash table cannot fit in memory? So his question is, what if the hash table does not fit in memory? So one, we're ignoring that. Uh, but two, the in, in, in a real system, you'd have to spill a disk, right? So you would have to have a mechanism to to do this. It means you need like a buffer pool manager, right? And then in that case, you can do like the Grace hash join, where you basically it's 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 partitioning. So is it more so his question is, is would sort merge join be better if the, if the hash table does not fit in memory? Uh, the, the current literature says no. Even then, if you have to go out the disk, hash join is faster. 
Now, there are some scenarios where you, uh, if like the output of the, of the query needs to be sorted, and if the sort key is the same thing as your join key, then yes, you can do a sort merge join, and you, then you, you automatically get your data sorted the way you want it. And that would be faster than a hash join. But that, you know, that's, you, you know, you have to have a query that, that looks exactly like that to make that work. Okay, so on Monday, we'll do the parallel sort merge. And then on Wednesday next week, uh, we'll have the, uh, the, the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And you have to put out your code review for, the, for project three. Okay? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a simple more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze at escape. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with 